welcome to another edition of CUP in Conversation. Today we're talking about how Christians respond to the victims of war and, and particularly refugees. So we're really pleased to have Father Gareth with us and could you tell us a little bit, bit about you and where, you, where you're from, where you work, etc. Yeah, sure. It's great to be with you. My name's uh, Gareth Jones. I'm the vicar of St Mary's Ilford, which is the uh, we, the Smelly Belly Church on the, the high road in Ilford, um, and I've been here for 11 years. I'm also the refugee coordinator for the Church of England in Essex in East London, which is another part of uh, my job. And I'm originally from Yorkshire, so I'm, I'm not uh, from these parts, but I've been in the South uh, for about 20 years uh, now, and as I say, in Ilford for 11. Brilliant, thank you so much. So the first question we've got, you mentioned that you're the refugee coordinator for the Church of England in um, Essex, East London, so that would be the, di the diocese. Um, can you tell us a little bit, a, bit, a bit about your role as the diocesan um, refugee coordinator and what it involves and maybe any stories of, of anyone that's particularly helped? Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to. So I've been doing uh, that side of the work formally now for three years um, but that have been involved with refugees and, and asylum seekers and, and matters of immigration for, for quite a long time um, and Bishop Peter who's the Bishop of Barking uh, asked me to become the diocesan refugee coordinator back in I think it was 2017 so I have a general uh, oversight of, of refugee engagement and ministry uh, for the whole of the Diocese of Chelmsford and that is really a very varied role. Um, I have oversight of the way that individual churches engage with matters of asylum on the doorstep. Um, so for many churches in this part of, of the world, um, they will have asylum seekers or uh, what some of us call undocumented migrants in their congregations. And it's a really a very difficult area to navigate um, it involves dealing with the, the Home Office and the local authority and so I, I have an oversight of how we support church leaders uh, on the ground in that work. Um, we also uh, run the Refugee Welcome Scheme and Project in the Diocese, uh, which is a scheme which operates through the Home Office and it brings uh, refugees from, at the moment, just the Syrian conflict over to the UK and uh, we give them a house and we give them a support uh, structure for about two years to help resettle uh, them in the local community. That's a, a scheme called community sponsorship. Um, so at the moment we have three community sponsorships operating in the diocese. One of them operates through my own church. The family that uh, came to us in 2019 uh, through my own church have now been here almost Two years, it'll be two years in March. They're a, a family of five. Um, they're from Syria. They are refugees from Syria, or they are, as we prefer to say, they are people who are refugees uh, because we try not to label people. None of us like labels being put on us. And to label uh, people as refugees or asylum seekers can often make them feel less than human. So they are people who through their life circumstances uh, no fault of their own have become refugees. They haven't been able to stay in their own country because of war and persecution. They found themselves as refugees, either on the border of their own country or in another country. And the Home Office uh, in the UK has agreed to resettle them, give them a fresh start and a new life. So we, we help the Home Office with that scheme. Another part of the work is we have a, a refugee agency um, within the diocese, uh, our diocesan agency, which is called Essex Integration, uh, and we resettle on behalf of Essex County Council uh, people who are refugees via that scheme. So we've, we have nearly 200 refugees under our care in the diocese at the moment. So that's, that's part of the diocesan job is to keep an oversight on that. Wow, that's difficult. It's such a massive load of lots of people that have been helped by that scheme. That's really lots, inspiring. Lots of people have been helped, but lots of wonderful friendships and relationships um, that have been made along the way. 
Yeah, I can imagine. Thank you. Um, so what first inspired you to get involved in this particular area of ministry? Obviously, as a priest, you've got a wide, wide lot of things that you do. But what, what first drew you to refugees specifically? I think, um, Helen, like a lot of things in, in Christian ministry, you find yourself um, surprisingly in these situations. I, I never set out to be a refugee coordinator. My, my parish ministry here and in my, my previous parish in Brighton brought me into contact um, with these issues and, and you help individual people, of course. Um, that's part of the ministry of, of being a priest. Um, but I, I think it was almost by accident, uh, really. Uh, well, from my point of view, by accident, I, I'm sure from God's point of view, it was all in the grand plan. Um, that I find myself as, as refugee coordinator. I wasn't particularly drawn to the ministry, um, but now I am uh, involved and, and, and have, uh, I, I guess, you know, a lot of my work is, and my time is based around that ministry. I can't imagine uh, doing anything else because it's so life affirming. Um, the relationships that you make with people are, are two way. This is not about uh, do-gooders, helping other people. This is about establishing relationships. And I always say to, to people that I, I'm sure I take far much more out of it um, than, than I put in. Uh, it's it's, it's life-affirming. And I think that's at the heart of the gospel, isn't it? Jesus said that I've come to bring you life and bring life in all its fullness. Brilliant. Yeah, definitely. I've, I've always found that the best things that I've been involved in, I've not necessarily started to be started out to be involved in them, but I've been, somehow ended up in the midst of it and they've yeah, been yeah. the best. Thanks. So since you are involved in it, what Bible verses or church teachings kind of inspire you to kind of carry on with it or really speak to you in your involvement with refugees mm. and life and people who are refugees? Yeah, people who are refugees. and, and I mean, how can anybody sit down and, and, and read the Bible um, or, or even parts of the Bible, the Hebrew scriptures and the New Testament and not see glaringly that God has a heart for the vulnerable and the oppressed and the downtrodden. So, some theological uh, scholars call it God's bias for the poor and the vulnerable. And the church, if it is to reflect the teachings of Christ, and the heart of God should also have that bias to those who are on the fringes of society, those who are persecuted, those who don't have a voice uh, anymore. So if you look at, um, I guess not a lot of people open the book of Leviticus uh, these days. It's one of those very difficult books of the Bible to read, but nevertheless, it is the word of God. And if you look at Leviticus 19, it says, don't mistreat any foreigners who live in your land. Instead, treat them as well as you treat your own citizens and love them as much as you love yourself. Remember, you were once foreigners in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So it's right there. Um, there, there is no misinterpreting what the scriptures are saying there. It's saying do not mistreat those who are foreigners. And we might replace that word foreigner with refugee. Um, don't mistreat the refugee who lives in your land. And there's also laws there in, in the book of Leviticus. Le Leviticus is, is the book of the, the law, really. It's the priestly code. It sets out what you should and shouldn't do um, about providing for those who are what the Bible calls foreigners. In fact, some of the old translations call it aliens, the alien uh, in your land. It says, when you harvest your grain, Always leave some of it standing around the edges of your field and don't pick up what falls on the ground. Leave it for the poor and those foreigners who live among you. I am the Lord your God. Um, and then you can zoom ahead into the, the New Testament, look at the book of Hebrews, that wonderful uh, verse in chapter 13, verse 2. Be sure to welcome strangers into your home because by doing this, some have entertained angels unawares and one peter reminds us that we're all foreigners uh, the bible says that we're all foreigners in this world this is not our true and lasting home we are on a journey um, towards an everlasting home um, it says you say that god is your father but god doesn't have favorites 
He judges all people by what they do. So you must honor God while you live as strangers here on earth. So there's some really compelling biblical verses um, that speak about how we treat uh, those who come to live among us for whatever reason that may be. Yeah, there's quite a lot there, isn't there? And it, there's no sitting on the fence, as you say. This really? is very direct. Very, um, very direct. It's, it's very difficult to get around those verses, though some people will try, um, but it's very difficult to uh, reinterpret them. Yeah, OK. So you've sort of touched on this with, with the, the, just the sheer amount of, of scripture and, and Bible verses that that pertain to people treating um, people who are refugees well and asylum seekers well um, and the victims of war. Why do you think, though, generally, maybe aside from or including the fact that it's so prevalent in scripture, why do you think it's important for Christians to have this kind of view of, of, of what they can do for the victims of war, for people who are refugees? When um, Jesus was asked, um, what is the greatest of the commandments? Jesus said, well, there are two. The first is this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength and mind. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. And he said that loving neighbor as self is second to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength and mind, because he's simply saying that unless you love the Lord your God, you won't be able to love neighbor mm -hmm. as self. And unless you love the Lord your God, you won't be able to love yourself in such a way as you will wish to love your neighbor as yourself. So he put those two commandments, love the Lord your God and love neighbor as yourself. And he said, on these two commandments, hang all the rest of the law. And you might remember um, one of the, the smart Alex in the crowd said, well, OK, then love, love, love your neighbor. Who is my neighbor? Who yeah. is my neighbor? And Jesus told perhaps one of his most fa famous parables, that beautiful parable of the Good Samaritan. Um, and it's very easy to skim over the, the Good Samaritan parable without really understanding the dynamic of it. Um, you had a Levite who was of the priestly caste of the day, and you had a Samaritan, and they hated each other. They were not even meant to speak to each other in the street. And we're told that a priest walked by and did nothing. We're told that another religious official walked by and did nothing. But it was the, who was it? It was the Samaritan. It was the person who was on the really on the edge of society, kept away from community life, who came to the aid uh, of that man who'd been beaten up. So who is your neighbor? Jesus said, everybody is your neighbor. Even, even the Samaritan is your neighbor. Definitely, thank you. So you, this actually is uh, the next statement. It, it could actually, um, it could link to that actually, what you've just said. Um, but because this is aimed at people who are doing GCSEs, a lot of the people watching this will be doing GCSEs, and part of the exam um, is to respond to a statement. So we've given everyone that we've interviewed a statement and asked for their response. So your statement is, the church um, should, should seek to help people from within the UK before they seek to help refugees and people who are victims of war. What do you think and why? What do I think? Well, the first thing is the two are not mutually exclusive. Yes, of course, we need to help uh, those uh, around us, those uh, in the UK, as well as people who are seeking refuge and sanctuary in our own country. Um, but what I would also say is that there is really no place within Christian teaching for uh, an opaque nationalism. Um, we, are, we inhabit this planet, we inhabit this world as guests, guests of God, and we've been given it for a time as we journey towards our eternal home. Uh, and God is not partisan. God doesn't see somebody from the UK or someone from France or someone from Syria or someone from Lebanon or someone from Somalia or wherever. He sees human beings, he sees souls and he sees hearts. And God doesn't see international borders and neither should uh, the church. Um, there are some really, and I've already quoted, some really very specific verses in the scriptures about helping foreigners who are living at that time in the land of Jewish people 
and Christians and the church need to apply those principles um, in our own time. So I think the, you know, the, the wider answer is the two are not mutually exclusive. I'm often challenged um, because of the time, effort and resources that go uh, from our church into helping refugees. Well, what about the homeless on the streets of Ilford, for instance? Well, we help the homeless on the streets of Ilford also the two are not mutually exclusive. Excellent. Thank you so much. It's been really a great pleasure to have you with us today. And thank you for, for speaking oh, with such you. passion and clarity about, about how the church can help people who are refugees and the victims of war. You're welcome. Thank you, Helen.